In our last video, uh, we left off with this building here, and I was uh, basically giving you some background. Of course, this was the Fortune uh, Light and Power Company, but uh, we were talking about what preceded that, and that was the Port Gear and Gas and Light Company. After a shaky start for the gas company, um, people started to embrace uh, having gas in their homes. It was uh, uh, much more convenient. And by 1873, there were 40 street lamps, gas street lamps, in the city of Port Huron, and about 120 subscribers for gas. Under the sound policy of its officers and directors, the Port Huron Gas Light Company grew steadily and became one of Port Huron's most successful business ventures. The gas works on Quay Street became not only one of Port Huron's important utilities, but also a sort of an institution in the city. The peculiar mixture of fumes emanating from the plant was believed to be a cure for whooping cough, and parents of children afflicted with the infectious disease took the sufferers to the gas works to breathe of these fumes. In fact, this cure or relief for whooping cough was believed for many years and parents were still taking their children there for that purpose even after the turn of the century. These were great days for the city of Port Huron when stagecoaches arrived and left on schedules posted at the Huron House or one of the other numerous hotels. Of course, the Huron House was the number one hotel in Port Huron during that time period. It was located between Grand River and McMorrin on the west side of the street, closer to McMorrin. And although this picture isn't very good, it certainly is an historical picture that gives us a glimpse during that time period. It was a time period when the lumberjacks would invade the city every spring after floating their logs down the Black River. The lumberjacks also arrived uh, through Lake Huron into the St. Clair River riding herd over rafts of logs. A time when all the docks along the Black River and St. Clair River were filled with the schooners and steamers and barges with names like Haiti Wells and Kate Muffet and the Curfew, the Clipper Vision. It was a time period when the caulkers hammers and the whining plane saws and the steam whistles made up the industrial symphony of the town's activities. These were also the days of the so-called nostalgic 1870s, and within that decade and following the gas industry in rapid succession came the waterworks in Pine Grove Park. The city county building, or otherwise known as the old courthouse on Huron Avenue, and the post office on Water Street. And in the meantime, the sale of the Fort Gratiot Military Reservation provided an opportunity for the city of Port Jern to grow northward. And the decade to follow was to see the introduction of two new utilities, utilities that were to affect the Port Jern Gas Light Company. It was less than 20 years since the end of the Civil War, and Wilbur Davison was having a great year in 1883 at his dry goods store on, on the Opera House block of Military Street. The merchant and leading citizen knew that he had to do more to bring customers to his store to prosper. He had an idea that would bring more customers and curious future customers through his door in a way that would make P.T. Barnum envious. It had only been one year since Tom Edison had succeeded in bringing his dynamo online in the Pearl Street Station in New York City to provide a source for his first electrical distribution center. His newly developed practical incandescent light bulb was only a small part of what his product could do. He had plans for street lighting, transportation, and all kinds of appliances. Davison had eagerly read the accounts of the sensation in New York and wondered what effect the electric light could have on the city of Port Huron and his dry goods store. He set a goal to have the store lighted electrically in time for a big Christmas celebration. By the fall of 1883, he had installed an electric generator or dynamo powered by a small steam engine in the basement of his store. The first time the switch was thrown, the lights refused to flicker to life. Davidson and the engineers believed that the motor was too small to produce the speed they needed. He promptly sent the engine back to his maker to be replaced by a larger model. 
James Thompson and his son James Jr. were the millwrights that set up the new system and were discouraged when it failed to light the store. Thompson studied all the meager literature available on the fledging industry, and after Davidson agreed to accept responsibility for the dynamo if Thompson tinkered with the system, soon had the lights flickering and then brightly glowing. At that time, the available lights were of two types, the incandescent bulb that Thomas A. Edison was famous for, and the arc light. The arc light was an earlier development that was similar to a welder's arc in construction, thus being very brilliant, but inefficient, hot, and of best use later as street lights when it would be outdoors and high on a pole. These arc lights were what Davison chose to initially light his business. The newspapers did not fail to recognize the event as the following article attests. The Portrait and Daily Times, November 19, 1883. W.F. Davidson and Company, the Opera House dry goods dealer, are about to introduce the Edison electric light in their store and invite the public to call and buy something as a souvenir of the first electric light in Port Huron. Their advertisement appears in tonight's Times. Quite a marketing ploy. Buy something as a souvenir of the first electric light in Port Huron. Smart. The next article written was dated December 20, 1883, and it says this, The firm of W.F. Davidson & Company in the Opera Block is entitled to the credit of introducing the first electric light into Port Huron, the first exhibition of it having been made in their store on Wednesday evening. The power is supplied by a neat and compact three-horsepower engine supplied with steam from an upright boiler which is just sufficient to run the dynamo and feed three arc lights. The lamps furnished by the company are compact and handsome, and they have been so placed in the Davison & Company store that the entire interior as well as the walk and street in front of the building are evenly and brilliantly illuminated. The two lamps inside the store have opal shades, which tone down the extreme brilliancy of the light and diffuse it in all directions while the one in front of the store is enclosed in a clear glass globe. The trial Wednesday evening was a complete success, and the brilliant light attracted a crowd of admiring observers, both inside and outside the store. The apparatus and lamps have been put under the direction of Mr. A. H. Van Flat, manager of the company, who appears to be a very candid gentleman, and only asked to have the light furnished by his company, judged on its merits after a fair test. His first test of fortune having been so successful, we hope that it may continue to give us good satisfaction in regular use, and that a company may be organized here to introduce the light generally. Davidson had demonstrated the value of electric light and now proceeded to interest two other prominent Port Huron businessmen in forming a company. These men were Henry McMorrin and Charles F. Harrington. They became the driving force behind an enterprise that was on the cutting edge of a fledging industry. Thus came into being Port Huron's first electric utility, the Excelsior Electric Company of Port Huron, incorporated February 29, 1884. It was the first electric utility in St. Clair County and one of the first in the United States. It would not be until 1886 that the city of Detroit would see the Edison Illuminating Company incorporated. By November 17, 1884, there were enough merchants in Port Huron with faith in the system to have 17 customers sign up for electrical service. One of the most confident customers was a clothing merchant already in business for 14 years at the same location. Jacob Jacoby had even witnessed the birth of the gaslighting industry in town. He became one of the original customers of the Excelsior Lighting Company, and through the years into the 1940s, Jacob Jacoby was still operating his business after 50 years in the same location as a customer of all the successor electric companies. And as the business card says, it was located right across from the Opera House. As customer acceptance was indicated by the strong growth demand for service, the realization that a power plant, a central power plant, would have to be built, 
An Excelsior power plant was completed and consisted of 75 horsepower engine, a large boiler, and two dynamos. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this is a power plant that was built, but it isn't. It was a wooden structure, but it was built at this very same location. We don't have a real good picture of it, but if you look uh, in this picture here, looking down Black River, and as we zoom in on this high definition photo, you can see uh, this powerhouse, and you can see, of course, also that it's wood. Common Citizen's incandescent bulb was gaining popularity, making residential lighting a more practical competitor for the old gas lights. Fort Huron was also the site of one of the nation's earliest electric railway. Fort Huron was the second city in the country to continuously operate a scheduled electric rail system. The inaugural trip of the system in Port Huron took place on October 15, 1886. Even in Detroit, horse-drawn cars were being used as our famous trolley system was growing. In the spring of 1886, the Port Huron Gaslight Company experienced its first pack of competition in street lighting from the Excelsior Company. When that utility petitioned the Common Council for a contract to light the streets of Port Huron with 30 lights. The first conversion from gas to electricity and street lighting was made at the north and south approaches to the military street bridge. In this postcard you can see uh, the lighting that was uh, on the bridge entrances uh, as you go in here for a close-up and then as we cut across to the other side. And then in the background you can also see the lighting that was on the north end of the bridge as well. Uh, and also, this was where the first gas lighting was uh, established uh, on the bridge, even before the street lights. In the meantime, the Port Huron Gas Company had kept pace with the Excelsior Electric Company of Port Huron. By 1891, the company was selling appliances, and according to an advertisement in the Port Huron Daily Times, gas stoves were sold at cost. The company also owned a subsidiary company, the Port Huron Plumbing, Steam, and Gas Fitting Company, running connection with the gas plant. The original powerhouse on Water Street being made of wood was always in danger of fire due to the nature of its use to burn coal and produce steam. After several smaller fires, it burned to the ground on December 17, 1897. While most of the machinery was soaked, it suffered only slightly from the fire. Service was entirely disrupted, and horses were brought in to keep the street railway operating. And the electric company did something amazing. They decided since the equipment was still good, it just didn't have a building, so they ran it in the open air. No roof, no walls. Two days after the fire, Fortune Daily Times wrote this article. The Excelsior Electric Light Company furnished incandescent and arc lights on the south side on Monday evening. Those who witnessed burning of the works on Friday could hardly believe that light could be furnished in so short a time. The City Electric Railway Company has several electric cars running and several horse cars. Six days after the fire, service was restored all over the city and the horses were displaced by the electric trolley once again. It must have been quite a sight for the power plant to be operated in the open air. The new plant was rebuilt on the same site, completed in 1898. It was a state-of-the-art power plant, one of the finest in the country, or in the world for that matter. Excelsior Electric Company of Port Huron grew steadily and prospered. In 1901, this company was reorganized as the Port Huron Light and Power Company. The main stockholders were the same, Henry McMorrin, Wilbur Davidson, and Charles Harrington, but they were now joined by James Davidson, who had taken over the Davidson dry goods store, and Margaretta Davidson, who was the wife of Wilbur Davidson. The first three made up the board of directors for the new company. As late as 1913, the line trouble department consisted of one horse-drawn wagon, one line repairman, and one helper. Service during weekends or off hours, unless of the most dire consequences, was not provided for. If that were the case, the customer was obligated to contact an acquaintance that worked for the company, who in turn would rouse the line repairman 
for repairs. Otherwise, you waited until the next business day for the office to open. Communication in those days was provided by a means of a loud steam whistle at the plant. If the repairman heard a long followed by a short blast from the whistle, he would leave the job he was on or cut short his lunch or haircut and head for the plant to get instructions. At the start of the new century, business was booming in Port Huron, with prospects of the city becoming one of the greatest manufacturing centers in the state. In 1902, in order to be ready for the great increase in power needs, Mr. Davison bought a 1,500-kilowatt horizontal steam turbine, something new in machine design, which was destined to supplant the old-type reciprocating engine. A wing was hurriedly added to the building, and the new machine, the first turbo generator built and installed in a central station by the General Electric Company, was ready to go to work. And here we have a photograph of it being delivered to the power plant. In 1911, Fort Huron Light and Power Company was sold to the Port Huron Gas Company. And then in 1919, the Port Huron Light and Power Company was sold by the Port Huron Gas Company to the Detroit Edison Company. This also included the gas operation, which included the gas plant facility between Grand River and Quay Streets. By 1922, the Port Huron area was prospering and service was extending into the surrounding area. It was then that a new power plant was completed in Marysville. This was one of the largest construction projects in the area at the time. By 1923, the old power plant on Water Street was phased out of service after 25 years of duty. The building was put into use as a warehouse facility for line crews and their trucks. It served that purpose for another 40 years before a replacement facility was built in Marysville on Ravenswood. The old building was still there on Water Street next to the old railroad bridge over the Black River until 2007 when it was torn down. It was the last remaining building that served as a tribute to the names that guided Port Huron into the future, not only as industry leaders, but as leaders of the community. Well, it took us a while to get here, but I finally got to tell you how this building came about. Of course, the building is no longer there, but every building has a story to tell, and this building certainly had a story to tell. Because of this building, Poor Turin could claim being one of the best lit cities in the state, if not the country, for that time period. Poor Turin, the city of light.